Our first speaker is, and to whom we owe so much this afternoon, this entire conference wouldn't be taking place if it weren't for Dr. Robert Enright, who is Professor of Educational Psychology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin in the United States. Dr. Enright has dedicated much of his life to research on the topic of forgiveness from the perspective of the social sciences, which I'll note as a philosopher that this social science perspective of his research and forgiveness is such that he doesn't just study the theory as to what forgiveness is, in terms of its, let's say, remote causes or the anthropology, a theory of the human person, but that he looks at it from the perspective also of data that he collects <coughs> is scientifically using the modern scientific method to look at what constitutes forgiveness and what forgiveness does to the one who practices forgiveness and to the one who grows in the virtue of forgiveness. In this way, he, is, he has been rightly called by Time Magazine, for instance, the forgiveness trailblazer. His work is defini definitely pioneering in this area. And his approach has been, from the beginning, as I say, scientific, without an appeal to a particular faith tradition. While he himself does adhere to a particular faith tradition. His work continues with this scientific approach, also applied to the educational field, in order to promote this virtue among children, who tend to be, with respect to maybe every field of education, the most receptive the most value, malleable, who can more quickly receive ideas and put them into practice. And he has courageously focused on the most difficult cases of forgiveness. Those who have suffered horrific incestual sexual abuse, for instance, at, their, at an early age. Those who felt it would be impossible to forgive, or those whom he has especially focused on trying to help and uh, all along while collecting the data in order to arrive at scientific conclusions. He's also now tenaciously focused on bringing this program in order to help those who live in communities that are infected by the insidious trauma of intergenerational conflict so that they might also be able to forgive and thereby liberate themselves from the offense that they've suffered at the hands of their aggressors. His, uh, his, his publications are of uh, many kinds, more scientific and ap academic, others that are more practical. I've found especially helpful for myself his, his book, which is also a good read, I think, his, his book, Forgiveness is a Choice. And the title itself is also an excellent expression. He has programs currently underway in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, in Liberia, in Africa, and in Galilee, in Israel. In Israel. Dr. Enrey, please. Thank you, Father Gall, and thank you, University of Santa Croce, for inviting me to speak to you. We come to you and we all come together because of an idea. We are all here for an idea. And that idea is that forgiveness is important. Forgiveness matters for our inner life, for our relationships, for our communities, and perhaps even our nations. May I be so bold as to say I think that forgiveness properly practiced can revolutionize humanity? I want to say that again so that it sinks into you. I think forgiveness properly practiced and over time literally can revolutionize humanity. And we haven't given it enough attention in the world. There was a 16-year-old girl in a European country who would go onto the internet every day and she ended up being bullied by her peers. And she went to the teachers and the teachers 
believed she was bullied, but didn't believe that she was so terribly bullied. And she got angrier and angrier because nobody was helping her. And the resentment built up in her and it turned to depression and she took her life by suicide. Had she known the power of forgiveness and how to forgive, I think she would be alive today. I know of a man who is spending his entire life in prison. He is in prison for life because he shot and killed every member of his family. When he was a boy, for his discipline, his father would have him crawl on his hands and knees on the driveway and pick up the mail for the day and then crawl back to the home. And when he came back, he was humiliated, scratched up and bruised. And that happened over and over and over again. And his resentment built up until he couldn't take it anymore. And when he was old enough to pick up his father's hunting rifle, he shot and killed his whole family. If he had known the power of forgiveness and how to forgive and how to stop the resentment that was building up in his life, I think the entire family would be alive today. And I think he would not be in prison. I know of a woman who let the resentment build up at work because she wasn't getting her proper rewards. She wasn't getting the proper praise. And she didn't even think about forgiveness and she would come home every day and she would be angry and she would take it out on her own children. And her own children were getting beaten up inside their heart because she was having a hard time at work until she finally learned how to forgive. And she stopped bringing home her resentment and the children got healthier and she got healthier and her relationship with her employers got healthier because she did know how to forgive. She learned it. And I have a friend in the Middle East who as a child had his home bombed. His home was bombed as a child. And he was never able to go home again. He was displaced. And the resentment built up and he was confused and he didn't understand how people could be so atrociously mean. And he too found his way to forgiveness. And now he has started a school that is integrating people who supposedly should not be getting along. And yet they are because he found the importance of forgiveness. He is transforming humanity. The woman I know is transforming her family. And tragically, I know of others who are no longer living or others are no longer living because they have taken the resentment out on them. You see, there's a big difference between those who have learned to forgive and those who have not. And that's why I'm here with you today to talk with you about the idea of forgiveness so we can start revolutionizing humanity rather than destroying it. And I think the biggest way to revolutionize humanity through forgiveness is what we call forgiveness education. Do you think that the 16 year old if she had had forgiveness education and learned about what forgiveness is and how to go about it when she was six and seven and eight years old, would she have taken her own life because of an inner rage that she turned on herself? I do not think so. I think forgiveness education itself is the beginning of life-saving connections among people. How many times have you had a thoroughgoing discussion about forgiveness in your own community? I'm guessing none of you have because forgiveness is swept under the rug. It's a virtue, just like justice, and we talk about justice all the time. You're late for work, you get a penalty. A child talks in school and they get a punishment. Justice is meted out all the time, but forgiveness is ignored. 
and I want forgiveness to be part of the educational institutions of the world. Here's why I'm frustrated. What if you had an antibiotic that could literally cure a bacterial infection and nobody ever heard about it? What if you had a cure for the unhealthy, toxic anger that I've been calling resentment in these four examples I just gave to you and nobody heard about the cure? Wouldn't you be frustrated about that? If it existed and we knew it worked and people slept through the idea, what might prevent the emergence of that unhealthy anger that can kill? What can prevent the emergence of the unhealthy anger that can bring children down or bring them down when they are adults? Two little words that might revolutionize humanity. Forgiveness, education. But first, the preliminary. When I use the word forgiveness, and you'll be hearing it a lot today, what do we mean? What's the definition of forgiveness? I think most people who will be speaking today will have some sense of agreement with this definition. And look at the definition. Three components when we forgive. First, we have been treated unjustly by others. We strive, we strive to get rid of the resentment. It's an active, ongoing process to get rid of that. I wish the 16-year-old had striven for that. And we strive, as we heard 10 minutes ago, to forgive is to love. We paradoxically offer, through the virtue of forgiveness, something positive to the one who hurt us whether it's kindness or respect or generosity or even love. Three points to the definition. You've been treated unjustly. You tried to get rid of resentment toward the one who hurt you. And you try paradoxically, paradoxically to offer goodness. Forgiveness does not mean to excuse what the other did. Had my 16-year-old friend learned about forgiveness, she would not have excused their bullying behavior. It was wrong, is wrong, and will always be wrong. The father's choice of discipline to humiliate his son when he killed the whole family would never be condoned or excused. It was wrong, is wrong, and will always be wrong. And we don't forget the injustice, but we remember in new ways when we forgive. And we're not just simply indifferent toward the situation or the other, because to forgive is to exercise a heroic virtue of being concerned about the other. When we forgive, we might not reconcile. If the person is harmful to us, we might forgive and not reconcile, because reconciliation is not a virtue. It's a coming together again in mutual trust. If the other is not to be trusted, we can forgive. And what does that mean? We will offer goodness, but we will watch our back. We will not reconcile. And to forgive is not to abandon the quest for justice. Had my 16-year-old friend forgiven those who bullied her, she still should have asked for justice that the bullying stop. To forgive and to seek justice are a team. They exist side by side. That's one of the biggest criticisms of forgiveness. Oh, if I forgive, then I have to go back into the abuse. No, no, no. When you forgive, you can learn to have the energy to fight another day. Here is typically what we find. Father Gall said we do research on forgiveness. Here's the pathway we bring adults through first. Then we'll talk about the children. First, we have the person recognize that they have been treated unfairly and that the effects, the effects of the injustice may be quite harmful. You see, the bullying of the 16-year-old wasn't the major problem. The major problem was all the effects that built up in her. 
of fatigue and confusion and hatred and resentment and depression. Those are what brought her down. The poisonous effects after the injustice occurred. We point these out to those who go through forgiveness therapy with us. We then ask people to commit to do no harm to those who have hurt them. Are you willing to make a commitment today toward those who, you, who have hurt you when you walk out of this auditorium to do no harm to those who have hurt you? That's the beginning of forgiveness. It's the beginning of getting rid of the resentment. It's not harming the other as they have harmed you. Then you begin, as you strengthen to do no harm, to begin seeing the other in a broader way. You see the inherent or built-in worth of the one who had hurt you, not because of what they did, but in spite of it. Then we ask people to bear the pain. Morton Kaufman in his Rayleigh Psychiatrist taught me that. He would ask his clients to bear the pain so they don't throw it back onto the one who hurt them. Or in the case of my friend, the woman who had trouble at work, so she doesn't toss the pain onto her children. When you forgive, you bear the pain so you don't throw it onto others, even unsuspecting others, like our children who don't deserve your pain. Forgiveness protects others from your pain. And then once we're strengthened to stand in the pain, we do the virtuous side of forgiveness where we offer something good to the other. Maybe it's a smile or a prayer or an answered email or something that acknowledges the person's humanity. And in doing that, we get, begin to find meaning in our suffering. I am growing as a person and I am seeing you as an I. I am an I, you are an I. The I-thou relationship of Martin Buber's philosophy. An I to an I, a person to a person. And that's when we begin to realize we have a new purpose in life, which might be to quell some of the pain in others, which I see happens a lot in clients with whom we work. So what then is forgiveness education? It's starting very, very young before the huge wounds of the world have happened to people. And it's helped students see how story characters, not themselves. You see, forgiveness education isn't therapy. We don't sit children down and shine a lamp on them and start taking notes. Tell us about your problems, okay? No. We introduce them to story characters who have had difficulties, who have had pains, and work their way out of it humbly, sometimes lovingly and mercifully. And it helps students as they see the story characters to know what kindness is and respect is and love is when treated unjustly. And if we don't bring it to the children by the time they're 35, 55, or 85, they might not know how to forgive. It helps students in the safety of classroom or home understand what forgiveness is, to begin seeing how others practice it. And only if they choose to do so might they forgive. Forgiveness education introduces students through story to the idea of forgiveness with no pressure to forgive. I want students to be drawn to forgiveness, not it being a grim demand on them. It increases cooperation in the classroom. It, increase, it increases academic achievement. Doesn't it make sense? If your heart is broken and I'm giving you a mathematics lesson, will you hear what I have to say? No. If we can heal the broken heart, they will achieve better. And our research shows that. And this can be done in as short a time as one hour a week for 12, 15, 17 weeks in an academic year. Many teachers have the time for that. Now to our scientific evidence. Does forgiveness education work? Yes. 
First and fifth grade in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am from Wisconsin in the United States. We worked with six-year-olds and eight-year-olds, and we had them go through stories where characters forgave, and at the end of that, their anger went down. And did you know the average child, as young as six in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is segregated and poor, comes into school already clinically angry? The average child has enough anger where a clinical psychologist is worried about the average child? And just learning about forgiveness through stories, their anger goes down to normal levels. And we have seen this too in primary three, which Americans would call first grade in uh, Northern Ireland, primary three and primary five. Their anger goes down too. And in this primary five, a lot of the students already were depressed. Annette Shannon is going to tell you why shortly. We have Annette Shannon from Belfast in a very difficult, challenging area of, of the United Kingdom of Northern Ireland. And their depression can go down as they see story characters learn to forgive. We've seen at-risk middle school students increase their mental health and their academic achievement. And the same thing with incarcerated youth in South Korea. America, Europe, Asia, children and adolescents can respond to stories and in seeing story characters get rid of resentment and offering goodness, they too in their own little hearts can begin to do the same thing. Our curriculum guides have been already developed by professional educators from age four to age 18, what we call in America pre-kindergarten to uh, grade 12. These teacher guides have been used in many, many countries. We have lots of guides. We have guides for, for families, anti-bullying guides. I wish, I wish, I wish my 16-year-old friend had such a guide back then. She did not. Mm -hmm. And we also have a guide for elderly dying of cancer in hospice. And by the way, their hope went up while their physical condition was deteriorating. Here's an example of a book. Horton, here's a who. He saved a whole little village this big because he said a person is a person no matter how small. That's inherent worth, ladies and gentlemen. That's seeing the unconditional worth in others. Seeing the who's of Whoville who were misunderstood by everyone because they were so small and he defended them because a person is a person no matter how small. And six-year-olds read this and they see Horton being abused because he is being silly in their view, but he holds fast and forgives the jungle animals for abusing him and he saves the who's. And if teachers cannot afford an entire book, which costs 12 United States dollars, we have summarized the book in one page. It's free. You can equip an entire classroom that might include 10 different stories, and they're all summarized for free. Forgiveness is forgiving, for giving away, you see, okay? Here's an example of first grade or primary three in Northern Ireland. The very first lesson talks about inherent worth, and they read Horton Hears a Who. Why did Horton want to help them? Because they are persons and all persons are, have worth. But he didn't know them. Why should he help them? Because they are persons, and a person is a person no matter how small. And these little six-year-olds can look up at the teacher and understand what the word worth means. Unconditional worth. And they can begin laying the foundation that even those who hurt you have worth. That doesn't mean we reconcile. That doesn't mean we throw justice away. But it means we respond to the other in a radically new way. That might revolutionize humanity if we all understood this. And then we bring in the materials for the teachers and they read what the objectives are so they don't have to do all the work themselves. And we have discussion questions that I just went through. Why would he 
bother with them. Why? Because they are persons no matter how small. And we add activities. Well, what if someone's better in football than another child? Do they have more worth? What if another child is richer or poorer? Or what if one child only has one parent and the other has two? Does one have more worth? No. And the punchline then is, even if someone pushes you down on the playground and hurts your knee, do they have worth? And it takes a while to understand that. Our forgiveness education programs are in a lot of countries now. These curriculum guides that we've built for teachers and parents and other helping professionals. Here are the examples. Right? Asia, Africa, Europe, the Middle East is opening up more quickly than any other area for us. We're in three major cities in Iran. We're in Saudi Arabia soon and Pakistan. Although they tell me Pakistan is in Asia, who knew? I thought it was the Middle East, but apparently it's Asia. See, I, I learned from others as well. And I just talked with someone before I came up here from Siberia and Russia. Ask me if I want forgiveness education to be planted there. I think that would be amazing. Eight reasons why you and I should take forgiveness education seriously. To help the student to become emotionally healthier. That's the psychological reason. To help the students or the teachers repair relationships. The interpersonal reason. To help the student and the teachers grow in character. That's the virtues reason. To grow in the virtues. To help the students and the teachers to assist within reason those who have acted unjustly. That's the altruistic reason. You are giving a helping hand if you can. Some spit on that hand. Some drive a nail through that hand. And that's why you have to watch your hand sometimes when you reach out to the other because the other will not necessarily accept it. But forgiveness makes the offer. That's why it's so heroic. Why forgiveness education? To help forgiveness be a path to peace. Forgiveness has never been tried in the peace process. I am frustrated about that. Let us seek for justice. Let us try to get rid of oppression, but let's have an overlay of forgiveness which can help energize us and help us fight another day. It can help us understand that we have an obligation to make the world a little better place. It's also a way to tap into our own philosophies of life and religious tradition and grow more strongly in that tradition. Cardinal Tagle of the Philippines is very interested in making forgiveness education a part of the new evangelization of the church. Why not? It can quicken the heart and improve relationships. And finally, Forgiveness is good as an end in and of itself. It is simply good. If someone spits in your face when you forgive, it is still good. If you don't get you want, what you want out of forgiveness, it is still good. Because it is a moral virtue. And is it a moral virtue based on the strength to love when others are not loving you? And I think we need more of it. I would like to stop here and entertain a question or two, and then we will have the next speaker. <laughs> question or two. Yes. How do you address the parents? Because sometimes you can learn forgiveness and, and it's unlearned at home. Well, it's an imperfect world and we do the best we can and sometimes it is unlearned at home. But you know what? If we keep persisting throughout the grade levels, eventually it will happen there. But we also, in school I mean, but we also have two parent guides for parents themselves. And we have done research in Belfast, Northern Ireland on parents teaching children to forgive. And you know who gets the most out of it? The parents. So when parents use the curriculum material to help the students, it's the parents who end up forgiving to the deepest amount. 
So I would love to see more of it in the parent sector because it helps them be, become better people. And did you know when teachers, after they teach and we evaluate the programs, about 90% of them tell us they themselves become better people because they've taught forgiveness? One more. Yes. Okay, how can we live forgiveness inside of us without necessarily having an external reward or anything else? I wrote a book about that. It's called The Forgiving Life. And what I recommend in that book is that you practice forgiveness in little ways every day and you make an inventory of those who have hurt you from when you were young until now and you, you forgive every one of them so you clear the decks, so to speak. And what, then you truly are living an internal life of forgiveness. And then the key is, how do you give forgiveness away to others? The forgiving life is not just for me. The forgiving life is for me to go, grow strong in the virtue so that I can give it to others. And that's why I'm standing in front of you today. I'm not here for me. And I hope you're not here just for you, but... You want to start forgiveness to heal your inner wounds so you can be effective for others. Thank you.